following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The Arcanum 21 depicts in its primary graphic a man who stands upon the back of a crocodile. Within his hands, he grasps a sacred cross, the Egyptian Ankh. And he also holds a staff. And over his shoulders, the skin of a tiger or a jaguar. And the crocodile under his feet, with his mouth open, gazes upward ready to consume the daring warrior who stands on his back. The 21st Arcanum, for some centuries now, has been misplaced in the Western tradition. It has been confused with the 22nd with the return of life, the return to life. The 21st Arcanum has been called the Fool, or the card zero. And not without a good basis for this mistake. But we know in the Gnostic tradition that the 21st card, or rather this card of the Fool, belongs, in fact, in the place of the number 21 and is related to the Hebrew character Shin. You will remember that in the Hebrew alphabet, there are 22 letters. These 22 characters symbolize and encode a great depth of initiatic wisdom. And each letter implies and indicates many important facets of the path to the self-realization of the being. When we integrate our study of the tarot with the study of the Hebrew letters, we uncover why Each element is in the position that it is in. Therefore, by analyzing the character Shin and understanding the relationship of that character with the Arcanum 21, we understand why the card belongs where it does. The primary evidence for this is found mostly in meditation. But we find some scriptural authority upon which we can acerbate the claim that the Western tradition has been mistaken for a long time. 
When we analyze the books of the Bible, we discover naturally that the Hebrew characters play an important role in illustrating important structural concepts. And by understanding the esoteric and symbolic nature of those characters, we can penetrate deeper into the mysteries present within the Bible. When we look into the book of Genesis, written by Moses, we find there are 50 chapters. And the 21st chapter has a direct relationship to the 21st Arcanum, as you would expect. In the same way, when we look into the book of Revelation, which is the last book in the Bible, we also find that the 21st chapter of its 22 chapters relates directly to the 21st Arcanum. It's important for us to analyze, to take the concepts, the intellectual information that we gather from these courses and apply it. The study of the Hebrew characters and the study of the 22 arcana is given so that we can advance the knowledge of our own selves, so that we can penetrate into the mysteries that reside within our own consciousness. Not so that we become bookworms or become erudite or gather this type of information in order to impress others. This information is given for the well-being of our own development. The character Shin has a curious shape. Of course, we know now that every character in the Hebrew alphabet contains a great deal of symbolic wisdom. And in the character Shin, we see a shape that has three points, or in other words, three yods which are suspended above a base and connected to it by three columns, three passages. Of course, you will recall throughout all of the lectures we've given the importance of the law of three or the triunity, the trinity. And it is the basis upon which the law of creation is made possible. So this character Shin represents a very important aspect of the law of three or the fundamental basis upon which any form of creation can be realized. We know by studying varying teachings that every individual has to work towards the development of themselves. And this in itself is a form of creation. But self-development is not a matter of intellectual information. True self-development is not a matter of making promises or having good intentions. Self-development arises through works of creation. Through works. It arises through practical steps. And the character Shin, this 21st character, points exactly to the work that has to be done. In Gnosis, we call this arcanum transmutation. And the term transmute indicates as well precisely the work that has to be performed. The prefix trans means across from one to another. And mute comes from mutate or mutation, which is, of course, to change, but to change from one form to a different form. So to transmute is to take some element and transform it into something totally different, totally distinct. In Gnosis, you'll hear the term mutant. We're not referring to comic book mutants. 
A mutant is a person who's different. Moses was a mutant. Jesus, a mutant. All the great prophets are different people. Human, but not like us. And this is because they've performed the work of transmutation. To take advantage of the possibilities that are latent within the human organism and to perform a work of creation to become something distinct, something different. We look into the Bible and we discover in the book of Jeremiah that when God is instructing his prophets, he says, Behold, I set before you a way of life and a way of death. This indicates precisely this arcanum. And you'll note that this quote that I just gave you is from the 21st book of Jeremiah. The 21st chapter. A way of life and a way of death. What's shown here is really the one path which Jesus spoke of. But you have to remember that if you are wandering in a wilderness and you come upon a path, that path will go two directions, not just one. So you have to choose which way to proceed. Life is no different. All of us are stuck in the wilderness, lost in darkness, without any real true sense of who we are or where we are or where we're going. For us, life is a series of circumstantial accidents upon which we have little or no control. We are tossed about by the forces of life and have very little control or will to exercise upon our own circumstances and in the guidance of our own life. This is because we are, in fact, lost in the wilderness. This is the definition of the fool. The fool, related to this arcanum, is that one, like the warrior, but who wanders in the wilderness without a sense of direction, who wanders tossed about, confused, blind. This duality the way of life and the way of death, the warrior and the fool, is also illustrated in the Bible. Chapter 21 in the book of Genesis. When we analyze the book of Genesis, written by Moses, we have to recall Moses was an initiate. Moses wrote his books in Hebrew and with a type of code, a kind of system, which would reveal information to those who were initiated further and further into the mysteries of their own inner development, the mysteries of God. When we take, for example, the various arcana that we've been studying and we start to look at the book of Genesis, just to isolate that, we start to see how we can practically apply the teachings we've been gathering in these studies of the arcana. Related to the life of Abraham, specifically, we can start to unfold how the Bible takes and encodes the arcana of the Tarot. Some, uh, a few lectures back, we discussed the Arcanum 16. And the Arcanum 16 illustrates a fulminated tower or the state of the fallen man. And in that graphic, we see initiates who have fallen from grace and they are symbolized by inverted pentagrams. In truth, this same symbol of the inverted pentagram is also a symbol of the Arcanum 21. Because 21 is also has a duality of fallen and arisen. So actually, I should put this graphic at the bottom. The inverted pentagram isn't 
upside down man. A man who has fallen into the path of death. And an upright pentagram or five pointed star is the upright man, the man who stands on his feet, the warrior. So here we see the first indication of how this 21st arcanum can become confusing. In the process of receiving visions or performing divinations, we can be given the answer 21 or be shown this image of the 21st arcanum. So then we have to determine is the answer the warrior or the fool? In the book number 16, the chapter 16 of Genesis, we read the story of Abraham. And of course, Abraham is the father of all the great religions. His name means father of the multitudes. From him, we, we uh, attribute the religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. But in the early books of Genesis, in chapter 16, he's not yet called Abraham. He's called Abram. And his wife is called Sarai. And they did not have any children. Now, of course, we know in Gnosis that all the characters of the Bible are symbolic. Abram has levels of meaning. On one level, he can indicate the individual as an initiate, the individual as a seeker after the light. He can also indicate the inner being, the father, Abba. These two, Abram and Sarai, had a slave, a maidservant, whose name was Hagar. So, because they didn't have children, Sarai told Abram to fecundate the slave, the maidservant, and thus they would have a child. So here we see, in the chapter 16, that Abram has two wives. It's interesting to note that Hagar is an Egyptian slave and her name, Hagar, means forsaken. Now, Hagar, of course, has a son. And that son is Ishmael. The name Ishmael means God heeds. Now, in this chapter 16, once the child is born, a conflict arises. And Sarai tells Abram to throw out the slave woman and her child. And so the mother and child are ejected from the home of Abram and wander out into the wilderness. But an angel of the Lord comes and tells her to go back and says, actually, it's, her son is not born yet. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. When she's pregnant, she goes out into the, the wilderness. The angel comes and says, you will have a son named Ishmael, and he shall be a wild donkey of a man. His hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him.
So this wild donkey of a man is the fool. This is the fool who's born of the slave woman. The slave woman, of course, is our own divine mother nature. That aspect of the divine mother who works within the sphere of Malkut with the forces of involution and evolution. And her children are slaves as well. Slaves of the wheel of samsara. Slaves of life and death. Slaves of karma. Now what's very interesting about this name of Ishmael is that it's God heeds, which indicates that God respects his own laws. God places into motion laws and respects those. We don't. That's why we suffer, because we break those laws. In chapter 17, we see that God offers to Abram a covenant, a promise. And of course, this relates well to the Arcanum 17, hope. And when we advance a little further, we come to chapter 21. In chapter 21, Sarah has a child. And this child is named, in English we call him Isaac. But in Hebrew it's Isaac, or Isaac. So here we have the warrior. Now, of course, when Isaac or Isaac is born, Sarah, the wife of Abraham, says, cast out the slave child because he cannot share in my inheritance and the inheritance of the household. So the slave woman, Hagar, and Ishmael are cast out into the wilderness. Now here we see the fool of the tarot who wanders in the wilderness. Of life. And we have Isaac who remains in the house of his father. So Isaac symbolizes the soul. When we look deeper into the the names of each of these symbols, we also find many levels of meaning. Ishmael when you add up the characters that make the name, the total is 451 because each letter is a number. And when you reduce that 451 Kabbalistically, it becomes the number 10. So Ishmael, who's the fool, the wild donkey of a man, is a slave of the number 10, the wheel of karma, the wheel of samsara, the wheel of life. And we look at Isaac, or Itzak, his name, when added together, becomes 199, which when you reduce it, is 19. 19 is the alliance. And it's from the sacred alliance, the Arcanum 19, that the soul is born. So we see within the names themselves how the Arcana are perfectly represented and how they indicate the meaning of each character in the Bible. This is how we have to apply the study of these courses, is to take the Bible, to take the scripture and study it and analyze the numbers, see what they mean. Go deeper into the superficial levels. Of course, the name Hagar, the mother of the fool, the slave woman, 
her name, when added together, becomes 208, which of course reduces to 10 once again. So again we see the wheel of samsara, the wheel of life. The one who wants to work in these studies, who wants to advance in the comprehension of their own mind, the comprehension of God, has to take the lessons offered within the scripture. We see within ourselves, we have both possibilities. We have within ourselves the fool, the fool of the tarot, the one who's lost in the wilderness and cast out of the home of his father. The father is God. We're cast out because we do not know God. We do not dwell in his house, in his residence. And this is because of karma. Because of the crimes that we ourselves have committed. Crimes against the laws that God has established. And so we remain enslaved to the wheel of life and death. The way to rectify that, to change that situation, is taught by the Master Jesus in chapter 21 of the book of Matthew. Do you remember what happens in chapter 21? Jesus rides a donkey, a wild donkey of a man, Ishmael. Jesus commands his disciples to bring him a donkey, which he rides into Jerusalem. This is a symbol of the necessity for the initiate, the practitioner, the consciousness itself, to dominate the mind, to conquer the animal mind, the donkey. And Jesus rides the donkey into the celestial Jerusalem. How do we know it's the celestial Jerusalem? Because in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, is described the celestial Jerusalem. Do you see the correspondences? Chapter 21 from Genesis, Isaac is born. Chapter 21 from Matthew, Jesus rides the donkey. And chapter 21 from Revelation, celestial Jerusalem. There's a relationship between these. It's a relationship illustrated in this graphic. The initiate has to be a warrior, has to stand upon the animal. In this case, an Egyptian crocodile. The crocodile has a dualistic significance. In this particular image, it's primarily representing the ego the animal mind, the mind of the animal that we have which wants to consume, which wants to eat. And we see that the crocodile has opened its mouth and is ready to consume, to eat. But to eat what? The animal is a slave of sensation. The animal does not have the capacity to conquer desire. The animal is enslaved by desire. Ishmael symbolizes the animal mind, the donkey, which is enslaved by animal desire. Desire for what? Sensation. The animal is enslaved by sensations. Typically, when we discuss sensations, we talk about the physical ones. We have the sensation of sight, the perception which allows us to receive and interpret visual imagery. We have the sensation related to our ears. 
We have sensation related to taste, to touch. There are five primary physical sensations. But we fail to realize our own relationship to sensation. Within us, we have the consciousness. That which allows us to be alive. Our ability to perceive. And as we exist within a physical organism, we're receiving impressions, vibrations, from moment to moment. These impressions strike against the consciousness They're received as impacts from the exterior world. So in this moment, we are receiving visual information, visual data. As raw data, it's just images, just pictures. But we translate that. That data, that information is interpreted. When we see something, the mind attaches meaning, attaches importance, attaches labels, attaches a value. The value may be good, it may be bad, it may be indifferent. But it's this process of translation where our problems begin. When we receive information through the senses and our consciousness is not awake, that information, that data, is interpreted mechanically by the animal mind in accordance with the conditioning of that mind. We see an image of a car. If we come from a background of a native person, a person who's always lived in the wilderness, the image of that car will produce a particular kind of action, a reaction in the mind, a particular kind of interpretation, which will be distinctly different from the type of person who's lived around cars their whole life. Another example would be a dog. A person in the Western culture who sees a dog and receives that impression, that image of the dog, will attach to that image all of its own, his own or her own past experiences related to dogs. So if that person had a traumatic experience, fear will arise. If that person has always been close to dogs and loves dogs, then the sight of that dog will arouse love. Curiosity. But if a person from another country where dogs are hated, where dogs are despised, sees a dog, those qualities will arise. Repugnance. Repulsion. And in some countries, dogs are ignored. And in that type of person, the image of a dog will generate indifference. Why is this important? It's important because in each reaction, energy is transformed. Unfortunately, that energy is being transformed without awareness. And this is the problem. Within our organism, 
exists fire. Shin, as a character, represents fire. And you can see in its fingers, it looks like flames. That fire is the fire of the Holy Spirit, the fire of the, tri- the Trinity, the fire of God. That fire penetrates within our organism as a resource, as fuel. And we utilize those forces from moment to moment according to our use of the mind. Of course, the most refined presence of that energy is sexual energy. It's the most potent. But that energy actually is what illuminates our three nervous systems. And it's through the nervous systems that we perceive sensation. So as we perceive imagery, as we hear sound, as we taste, as we touch, we're transforming forces. But we're utilizing the holy character of Shin. We're utilizing energies which God has given to us. Those are creative forces. The law of three embodied in this character. So when we receive an image which arises in us fear, those energies are utilized by that fear to feed itself. And that fear becomes stronger. If we have a conflict with a person and someone is speaking lies about us, And we hear about it. Those impressions, those words, the gossip, the story, enters into the field of our consciousness. And we take that data. We interpret it. We translate it. But we translate it according to our pride. Our pride which says, I'm innocent. I'm a good person. They're lying about me. What does that generate naturally? Anger. Resentment, fear, fear of rejection, fear of people laughing at us, fear of people leaving us. Each one of those little processes is a transmutation, a transformation, but along the way of death. Because that energy is being incorporated by the animal mind. The animal mind which desires for pride to feel good. The animal mind, which desires to be admired, which desires to be envied, which desires respect. Sensation is not limited to the desire for chocolate. It is not limited to the desire for sexual pleasure. It includes them. But animal desire is for sensation. And sensation is beyond mere taste, touch on the physical level. We tend to think of sensation as merely physical. And it's true. When we experience anger, we may feel physical sensations related to anger. When we feel shame, we may feel physical sensations related to shame but we also experience emotional sensations, mental sensations. Think about it. Where do you feel sensations when you're dreaming? Not with your physical body, because your physical body is asleep. But when you're dreaming, you can taste, you can touch, you can hear, you can see. This is because the astral protoplasmatic body and the astral solar body also perceive sensation, but in the astral world. The mental body, what we call the mental body, which is really just the animal mind, also perceives sensation, but in the mental world, related to the mind. Our consciousness experiences sensation in its level. 
and all the levels of the mind, all the levels of the consciousness, sensations occur because in all levels there is matter. And sensation is a vibration of energy and matter. Beyond physical matter. Here we have an important aspect of the 21st Arcanum. 21, of course, if we break that down Kabbalistically, 2 plus 1 is 3. This law of 3 is that force, the law, which manages creation. And of course, as I mentioned, we can create for good, we can create for bad. What Western esoteric traditions have called the astral body is really just the body of desire, which in Sanskrit is called the Kama Rupa. And in Gnosis we call it the lunar astral body. It is not a true astral body. It is what we call protoplasmic. This is because this body has been given to us by the Divine Mother Nature. Do you remember who she is? Hagar. The slave woman. Hagar symbolizes how the Divine Mother Nature, through the auspices of God, receives the Yod, the creative forces of God, related to the number 10, which is this Yod of Shin. There's three Yods at the top, right? And that fire, that impregnation, develops in us and we enter into the process of evolution. And through that process are born our protoplasmatic bodies, the lunar astral, the lunar mental, and of course our physical and vital bodies. In all the different religious traditions, this is symbolized. In the Gospels, we know that Jesus, who symbolizes the Christ, the one that can save us, he is betrayed by three traitors. These three traitors symbolize three aspects of our own psyche. They are, of course, Pilate, who is related to the lunar mental body or the animal mind, which reasons. And Pilate says, I wash my hands of the whole thing. I'm not guilty. I didn't do anything wrong. He's guilty. But he reasons. He rationalizes. And this is what our own mind does. We commit crimes all the time. But we rationalize it. We justify it. And this is the activity of this demon of the mind, We also have the lunar astral, which is that body of desires, the Kama Rupa. It's that part of us which is more emotional, which is more desiring of feeling, desiring of sensation. We also have, this one's called the demon of desire, right? The demon of yeah, the demon of desire. And then we have the demon of evil will. Who's oh, I forgot. The lunar astral or the demon of desire is also called um, Judas. Evil will is Caiaphas in the gospels. These three traitors are also in the Egyptian mythology a poppy, high and nept. They're also in the Masonic tradition, the three traders of Hiramabif. We have three traders in many different traditions. Dante's Inferno, 
the Divine Comedy, and the Ninth Sphere itself and the Mouth of Lucifer are three traitors. These three traitors are an inverted triangle. Black because of the ego. And they symbolize different parts of our own animal mind. These are the parts of our mind which take us on the path of death. Which desire to take the forces of Shin, the forces of God, and utilize them to feed desire. To fortify our sense of self. to help us find security in material things. And they hypnotize us with many illusions. This is why in Buddhism, these three are represented by the three daughters of Mara. Mara is that demon who tempts the Buddha by sending his daughters who weave illusions to tempt him. These are symbolized by the three temptations of Jesus when Lucifer appears and tempts him three times. These temptations are within our own psyche. And we face these temptations every day. To become a warrior requires that we take those forces the forces of Shin, and we comprehend sensation. The Buddha Shakyamuni said, whether in praise or blame, gain or loss, victory or defeat, be like a great tree in the midst of them all. Be serene, be indifferent whether in pain or in pleasure, whether in profit or in loss, whether in riches or in poverty. To do that requires that we comprehend sensation, that we understand sensation, that we are not enslaved by it. And this is how we're tested. This is how our own psychological trainer who's within us, presents us with temptations, presents us with ordeals through sensation. Not through the intellect. If it were through the intellect, the path would be easy. God would say, well, what do you think? Do you think it's bad to kill? And we would say, well, of course. Say, okay, you can come. Because we would just think, we would just rationalize. We would just have the idea and that would be enough. It's not. Nowadays, many people think it is. Unfortunately, humanity is hypnotized by sensation. Hypnotized. Asleep. And believing and thinking and imagining, but suffering lost in the wilderness, being consumed by the ego, the crocodile in the waters. To conquer the enslavement of the animal mind is to sit on the donkey as Jesus did, which means that the consciousness has to establish dominion over the mind itself. Consciousness is willpower attention, but directed in accordance with God's laws, in accordance with the Dharma, the Eightfold Path. In order to conquer sensation, one must comprehend it. That is, when we face an ordeal, when we face a temptation, we have to establish conscious dominion over ourselves. The desire arises to gain a possession. Have you observed in yourself our own addiction to shopping? 
The American culture is completely addicted to the sensations of shopping, and they don't even know why. And they're spreading and infecting the rest of the world with this addiction. Americans shop and shop and shop, and they buy things and they stuff it away and they never use it. Why is that? It really makes no sense. It's because the American mentality is hypnotized with consumerism. And this hypnosis is based upon the addiction to a particular sensation. And this sensation has different aspects, different facets. Primarily, it is a matter of security. Through the media, through advertising, through television, big companies and this idea of the American way hypnotizes the viewers of television, the readers of magazines, with this subtle notion that if you get this product, you'll be happy. But it's a happiness that is contrasted with fear. That if you get this thing, you will feel secure. You will feel successful. You will feel like you made it. And that has different aspects depending on what they're promoting, what they're selling. In the end, you can observe in any American city the hordes of people who flock to the stores and the malls to buy and buy and buy and waste and waste and waste. People stuff their houses with possessions. They have to get storage spaces to fit all their other possessions, which they don't use. They get one thing, and they have it for a little while, and then they want a better one. So the old one goes out in the garage, and then the new one comes. And there's this step-by-step accumulation of material goods. Why? What is this based upon? What does it solve? How does it help? Who finds happiness from material goods? Who finds serenity from possessions? When all possessions are subject to impermanence, all of them will be taken away. All of them will decay. All of them will fall apart. To find security in external things is futile. The fool is the one, the fool of the tarot. If you look in the classic image of that card, the fool, he's carrying a stick with a bag. The bag is all his attachments, all the things that he thinks he needs to be happy, to dress a certain way, to appear a certain way, to have certain possessions, to own certain things, to belong to a certain group. This is all foolishness. Because in the space of a heartbeat, death arrives. What difference would it have made? All of these things. We have this notion that the material development of our culture has driven us to reach these great heights of technological achievement and that our civilization is the greatest in history. This is a fallacy. Our culture, our world, is consumed with suffering. We have so many beautiful inventions and still people starve to death every day. We have so many beautiful things, so many things that we're proud of. And yet, in these times, there is more slavery in the world than ever before. But we don't know it. We ignore it. And we ignore it because our own donkey mind is so addicted to sensation 
so addicted to trying to make itself feel better that we cannot even perceive the realities around us, the tremendous suffering that's happening with our neighbor, with our family members. The comprehension of sensation comes when in each moment we analyze what is arising and what is passing in us. And we question our own impulses to act. We question our own feelings. We question our own thoughts. We begin to exercise conscious control over our activities. It begins here in the physical world. It begins by exercising conscious control over our activities in our three brains. The three brains are the vehicles through which these three traits work. Pilate, the demon of the mind, works through our thoughts, through the way we rationalize, through the way we reason. Oh, I really need to buy this because of this and that. Oh, I can really see good reasons to get it. I really need that. I really need to make this and that change. I really should leave my wife because of A, B, C, and D. I really should blah, blah, blah. With craving. And with aversion, it does the same. Oh, I shouldn't do that because of blah, 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 blah. Desire in itself is always in this pendulum, craving and aversion, good and bad, for and against. And the intellect loves that game, loves to play the game of yes and no, maybe, maybe not. And we become identified with that, hypnotized by that. And the donkey loves it. In our emotions, in the emotional center, we have the way that we're seduced by our own feelings. The way that we're seduced by desires through the heart. We feel bad. And so we need to go buy something to feel better. We feel bad. So we need to eat something to feel better. We feel bad. So we need to punish someone to feel better. The demon of desire works through the heart and tempts us with emotional cravings and emotional aversions. The demon of evil will also works through the heart. Because it's through emotion, through feeling, that we express our evil will. And in this sense, evil will means will that is not in correlation with the will of God. In other words, egotistical will. The will of the false self. Through our motor instinctive sexual brain, We're also tempted through our instinct, through sensation, through sex, through habits, through all kinds of mechanical behaviors. So we have to develop the capacity to become conscious of all the levels of our mind and to decide consciously, is this thing that I'm doing right Is this in accordance with Dharma? Is this something that God wants for me to do? My own being? My own Yidam? My own Abba? Or is it something that I want because I want it? That has to be questioned. It's self-will that leads us to suffer. The guidance of God is what leads us to escape suffering. And that guidance comes in the form of dharma. It comes in the form of law. It comes in the form of his direct guidance. We receive that through Sarah. Sarah, in the story of Abraham, has levels of meaning. She's related to Zayin, the Hebrew letter. She's related to the divine soul, the divine consciousness. 
She's related to the Divine Mother. She's related to the wife of the initiate, the mother of the initiate. She is the three Marys of the Gospels. Those three Marys of the life of Jesus. It's through the intervention, the blessing of the Divine Mother, through the guidance of our own being, that we come to know divine will. And we receive the guidance we need in order to conquer the animal. Who assists the great heroes? Theseus, Perseus, Orpheus, Hercules, the goddesses. It's always Venus or Aphrodite or Athena who's giving them what they need in order to conquer the Minotaur, to conquer the Hydra, to conquer all those animals, all those beasts, the crocodile, which is within our mind. That goddess, very beautifully, is illustrated in Tibetan Buddhism by Tara. Tara is said to have 21 aspects. Tara is the goddess of compassion. It's said that when the cosmic Christ, Avalokiteshvara, or Chinrezi, gazed down upon all the creatures who were suffering in the wilderness, he had so much compassion that he cried. And from the tears of the Christ was born a splendorous woman who is Tara this divine goddess. Every morning, in all the schools of Tibetan Buddhism, the practitioners sing the 21 praises to the goddess Tara. And in these praises, they represent and worship all the aspects of their own inner divine mother, who they say has 21 faces. Why? Why? Because she in herself is Shin, the fire. The fire which comes directly from the cosmic Christ. Tara is that goddess of compassion, that flame which can illuminate the mind. Her name means she who saves. And it's by harnessing the forces of Shin that we're able to choose the way of life. The Divine Mother has to embody herself within us, to be born within us. In other words, Sarah has to give birth to Isaac, to Isaac. Isaac represents the soul. Isaac represents the solar bodies, that divine chariot which Krishna will drive in the great war. Krishna, of course, being the Christ. Those, that soul, the solar bodies, are three. And they're born from the power of Shin between husband and wife, Abraham and Sarah, when they work in transmutation. Isaac is born after Abraham and Sarah take a vow of chastity. In other words, God commands them that every male shall be circumcised. And circumcision is a symbol of an ancient pact to cut animal desire, to cut the addiction to sensation, and to save those forces, those energies, and harness them with divine will in order to create the soul. Those forces which descend through the trinity 
Father, Son, Holy Spirit, through the three yods, descend into us through three vavs, into nun, the waters, the fish, those sexual waters that we have within us. By harnessing the forces of the yod, those potent sexual forces, we can create the soul, which is what Jesus meant when he said, you have to be born again of the waters sexually and the spirit, God. That process of being born again is the process of creating and developing the three solar bodies, the solar causal body related to Tiferet, which is the body of conscious will. Conscious will over sensation. Conscious will over the animal. The body of the solar mental body which is a divine vehicle for God to inhabit. The solar astral body, which is a divine vehicle. These three form a triangle. So here we see again the duality of the number 21, these three forces. The vehicle of the soul is symbolized by Isaac, by Isaac. And, of course, he's born in the 21st chapter of Genesis. In the 22nd chapter, Abraham is tested. And, of course, we will talk in depth about the number 22 in the next lecture. But as an illustration of the meaning of Isaac and Abraham we look to what happens in the first part of the chapter 22 in Genesis. God says to Abraham, you have to sacrifice your son. This is a great test of faith. A great ordeal. Abraham has to sacrifice his most precious thing, which is his beloved son. But he agrees to do it. He puts his son on the altar with the the wood and everything prepared to sacrifice him. And at the moment of of killing him, the angel stops him. This is a symbol of Abraham's own initiatic process and of the nature of the soul itself, Isaac. Number 22 is related to the end of the work. It's the final number, the final final letter of the 22 major arcana. The very purpose of the path is to develop vehicles for the Christ to inhabit, to create bodhisattvas, prophets of God. Those prophets can only be born if they surpass the fifth initiation, the fire, which is the creation of the solar causal body. And they receive the initiation of Tiferet. The Venustic, they enter into the Venustic initiations to incarnate the Christ, to develop Isaac. But that incarnation of Christ is the process of incarnating the law of sacrifice. The Christ is that vehicle, that force, that energy, which sacrifices itself so that life can exist. The Christ is the fire within every atom, the fire within every flower, the fire within every heart, the fire within every planet. That is Christ. That is Avalokiteshvara. That is Tara, the male and female aspects of this energy. When God says to Abraham, you have to sacrifice your son, This is symbolic of God saying, you have to give up everything to incarnate me. To incarnate the Christ, one has to renounce even the virtues, the powers, the glories, and the beauties of the soul. The one who enters into the path of the Bodhisattva even gives up his powers, gives them to God. 
gives them to Christ. So in the 21st Arcanum, it symbolizes a great process. Throughout is the necessity for us to comprehend ourselves. If we remain slaves of sensation, always willing to do whatever it takes to feed our pride, to satisfy our anger, to satisfy our lust, we will always remain the fool. The prophet, the warrior, is the one who conquers the animal mind. The one who stands upon the crocodile and who holds in his hand the key, which is the ankh. The ankh is the symbol of the alliance, the crossing of man and woman, the key of life. We know that this initiate is walking on the way of life because he holds that key in his hand with respect. And in his other hand, the staff, which symbolizes the spinal column, the staff of Aaron. And over his shoulders is the animal conquered, the jaguar. In ancient uh, Aztec culture, the jaguar knights were warriors, a warrior class, who were also initiated into the mysteries of the, the, the death of the ego. And the great mystery of the jaguar was to consume, was to conquer one's own ego. This has a curious relationship to the earliest forms of Bushido, which is the Japanese warrior code, in which the samurai would not fight if he was angry, would not enter into battle if he had a negative emotion in himself. And the entire development of that code of Bushido was the perfection of attention to develop conscious will over oneself, but perfect. In the top portion of this graphic, we see two moons, one black and one white. These are the antitheses. This shows the fundamental axiom of this card, which is the battle between the way of life and the way of death within our own mind. Are there any questions? Judas, like all the other prophets or all the other disciples, in fact, like pretty much every character, has many levels of meaning. Judas, as a physical person, as an initiate, was the closest disciple to the Master Jesus and thus was entrusted with the duty to betray him. And it's a positive thing or a negative thing? In that context, it is. And we have our own Judas within our own consciousness, which is an aspect of our own being who will teach us mysteries related to that. But Judas also represents aspects of the ego. But Judas the initiate was demonstrating that by betraying the Lord. His action was designed to symbolize parts of our own mind. In the same way, people say Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. She was not. She was symbolizing a tendency or a quality of our own animal mind. So we have to look deeper than just the literal levels of what each person, which each symbol contains. There's many, yeah, many levels. Um, that leads me to another question. Again. Sure, <laughs> go ahead. Um, Jesus, Judas, and Pilate, they're all real people as far as I know. Mm-hmm. Right. But my assumption is they're real people. The earlier Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, Ishmael. Mm-hmm. Why weren't they real people? Who says they weren't? I thought you said they were. You said they all 
They're symbolic. What happens is that the lives of the initiates become stories that are used to illustrate the teachings themselves. So parts of the initiate's life is used to later tell the story of initiation, to tell the story of the process. So, for example, Jesus, his life story was written as a symbol, but it's not his literal life. It's symbolic. The same with Moses. What's written there about Moses is symbolic. It may borrow from his literal story, but it isn't fully literal. The reason we have scripture is to teach us how to come out of suffering. And it would serve us no purpose to know the intimate details of the life of these people. What helps us is to understand the initiatic processes, the laws, the ordeals, the psychological lessons. And that's why the gospels and the scriptures are written the way they are. And this is true of every tradition. In the life story of Quetzalcoatl, in the Aztec tradition, we see the same thing. We see a beautiful story of how that particular initiate represented these mysteries. We see the same in the life story of the different saints and sages from India, from China. What's most amazing and confirms this point of view is when you compare them all, they all have the same elements. And so it confirms that these stories are symbolic. They may have aspects of literal truth but they're largely told and kept and passed on to teach us how to change. Do you have a question? Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, do you see any relationship as I've heard in, uh, in other uh, places that, you know, so uh, Abraham or Abraham, that there's some relation between uh, Hinduism, Abraham, Abraham, or like Brahma, or... Well, it is curious that you see in the name Abraham the word Braham, which is closely related with Brahma, or the I am of Hinduism. There probably is a relationship. But as to the details of it, I don't recall. Yes? Excuse me. Um, Sarai and Hagar. Mm-hmm. She was pregnant, right. To go back. And then later to be thrown out. I don't understand that. Okay, it's a good question. Sarai, mm-hmm. to do that, to, to cast her away when she's the one that made the choice of her. Did they have, are they two sides of the coin? Did, they, did that have to happen? In yes. In the, okay, let me explain. In the story of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, there are processes that unfold. Hagar becomes pregnant and is thrown out. And she comes back. And then she gives birth and she's thrown out again. What this represents is the, our own development. We are what we are because of God, who's Abraham, Abraham, right? But we also are what we are because of the ego, because of our own mistakes. And due to that, our own animal aspect that donkey, Ishmael, cannot take of the inheritance of God. So when, when Divine Mother Nature, Hagar, is separated, this is symbolic that the terrestrial realm of Malkut is separate from the realm of God, the Father, from his house. You follow? So when we inhabit this physical vehicle, we're in the wilderness. And our own Divine Mother Nature gives birth to our protoplasmic bodies, which is Ishmael. And we inhabit that. That includes this physical body. In early stages of evolution, as these bodies are being developed, we are in the house of God because we receive the commands of God directly as we develop in the lower aspects of the kingdom. But there's a stage at which when we take on these bodies and we start to develop the ego, that we're cast out. So we have to leave the house because of the ego, right? We cannot take the inheritance of God because the ego is alive in us. So we're cast out. Now, our divine mother nature loves us so much, 
she comes too. And to help us, to protect us. But what's curious about the love of the Divine Mother Nature is that if we don't kill the ego, she will do it. But it's not pleasant. And that aspect of the Divine Mother Nature is Durga, Kali, death. And she's that goddess who takes Ishmael and pulls him into hell in order to cleanse him of the ego, to consume him out of love. So that in the end, he becomes a purified essence once more and can restart the process to try again. Now all this time, we have Sarah, who has her son, Isaac, who's separate. And this is the soul, the consciousness. Now this has levels. I'm condensing. For the initiate, the one who's walking the path, the one who's creating Isaac, who's working with the alliance, and who's trying to become this warrior, this process also happens. Where in order to protect Isaac, to protect the inheritance, there is a separation made between the terrestrial man and the heavenly man. This is why there is sometimes periods of spiritual night where the initiate, the the one who's working, will have no recollection of experiences, will have no visions, will have nothing will be in the wilderness, like Ishmael. And this is to protect that inheritance and to pay karma. So there are levels to this story, and there are more. But as a basic idea, that's the the reason the story is written the way it is. It means that this Tara and Hagar is always in conflict in every one of us. Right. The point is made that Sarah and Hagar are always in conflict within us. And this is true. These are aspects of the Divine Mother within ourselves, who are in conflict with one another because they have developed different parts. Now, in the ultimate sense, they are both the Divine Mother, ultimately speaking. But in our level, there is that conflict, and it's because of the ego. And interestingly, you can see that in the 21 forms of Tara. She has many aspects. Some are fierce and wrathful, and some are um, very peaceful and serene. So you see that in all the different traditions, how the different aspects of God are symbolized. Any other questions? All right. Please join us for the final lecture next week. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.